On this edition for Saturday, May 5th, the United States and its NATO allies prepare for a new kind of war. Scores of unfilled jobs at the State Department impacting American diplomacy. And life under Hitler's rule reflected in art. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. For the second day in a row, President Trump headed out of Washington to meet with a friendly audience of supporters. Yesterday, Mr. Trump spoke to the NRA convention in Texas. Today, he was in Ohio. The topic was tax reform and the impact on local businesses. Mr. Trump used a public roundtable with business leaders to talk about his own poll numbers, his planned meeting with North Korea, and threatened again to shut down the government if Congress doesn't fund his border wall with Mexico. And you can't allow people to pour into our country the way they're doing. You just take a look at that mess that's on television right now. It is a total catastrophe. And these are the laws passed by Democrats so that we have open borders. They want open borders. We have to have borders. If you don't have borders, you don't have a country. So we're going to have one. So step by step. Ohio's primary elections are Tuesday, and the president endorsed Republican Congressman Jim Renacci running to challenge incumbent Senator Democrat Sherrod Brown in November. Hawaii's Kilauea volcano is continuing to erupt, forcing hundreds to evacuate in the Leilani Estates area where lava is flowing. The volcano began spewing lava and releasing sulfur dioxide gas on Thursday. A series of earthquakes yesterday afternoon also rattled residents. The U.S. Geological Survey said the strongest quake registered 6.9 on the Richter scale. The epicenter was close to the Kilauea volcano. It was the most powerful quake on the island since 1975. Oh my God, guys. Residents in nearby Hilo felt the quake, as did those as far away oh as the God. island of Oahu. Aerial footage showed that the lava was flowing towards homes in the Puna district of the Big Island. So far, fire has damaged at least two structures. No injuries or deaths have been reported. There were demonstrations in 19 cities across Russia today because President Vladimir Putin will begin his fourth term on Monday. A human rights group says more than 1,000 people were arrested, including anti-corruption campaigner and opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Before police took him away from Moscow's Pushkin Square, Navalny led chants calling President Putin a czar. Protesters in Paris rallied against President Emmanuel Macron and policies they say cut worker protections and give the police too much power. The far-left party Defiant France organized today's march. Monday will be the one-year anniversary of Macron's election. The events were mostly peaceful, but 2,000 police were deployed to avoid a repeat of violent May Day protests. NASA's InSight lander blasted off from California today on a six-month mission to Mars. Liftoff of the Atlas V. Armed with a seismometer for measuring Mars quakes, a hammer for probing beneath the surface, and a radio system for tracking its location, scientists hope to study the red planet's interior. The Atlas V rocket also carried test satellites that will serve as the lander's communications link. This joint U.S.-European mission will cost a billion dollars. The last mission to Mars was in 2012 when the Curiosity rover made a successful landing. On journalist Nellie Bly's birthday, read about her groundbreaking investigation into the treatment of the mentally ill. Visit pbs.org slash newshour. The Trump administration is phasing out a special immigration program, announcing an end to temporary protected status for 57,000 Hondurans yesterday. The Hondurans will have until January of 2020 to return home or remain in the United States as undocumented immigrants. Most arrived after Hurricane Mitch struck Central America in 1999. Many now have businesses, families, and children who are U.S. citizens. For more on what's happening to this long-running program and to the hundreds of thousands of people affected, we turn to USA Today reporter Alan Gomez, who joins us from Miami. So put this in perspective. This is just the latest country that's been uh, on the list and, and, and uh, actions have been taken against them. Um, how much of the population of people with TPS does this now represent? Yeah, this just represents the, like you said, the latest step. They've been methodically going country by country, um, eliminating TPS for, for these people that had it. Uh, it's about a total of about 317,000 people from 10 different countries that are in TPS. Uh, they've now cut it for 98% of that population. Uh, the, the most significant was El Salvador. They had 197,000 people who had TPS 
um, about 46,000 Haitians, these 57,000 Hondurans. Um, and yeah, so they're pretty much uh, winding down the entire program. What about the children that are U.S. citizens here? What, what kinds of ripple effects in terms of population are we seeing? You said 317,000 had the TPS protections, but then now there are entire families with some of those people. Yeah, and that's one of the most agonizing parts of this for the people who are going to be faced with this decision. Um, there was about 197,000 El Salvadorans um, who were in the program. They've had about 190,000 U.S. born children, so they're citizens. Uh, same with Hondurans, about 57,000 of those are in the program. They've had about 53,000 uh, children in the United States. And so each of them are going to have to make a decision. Do I go back to my home country that is gripped by violence and take my son or daughter who may or may not have ever gone to that country and may or mm. may not speak Spanish, um, or do I leave, go back and leave my child behind the United States, or do I stay in the United States, become an undocumented immigrant, risk deportation, and kind of put my family through that stress? Well, speaking of the conditions in those countries that they're going back to, we saw uh, you know a lot of headlines over the past couple of weeks about the caravan that has been moving north and is now stalled at the border. These are people that are seeking asylum from some of these countries because it's not safe for them to be alive. Yeah, and that's, a, that's another really difficult part of this. I mean, El Salvador, like Honduras, it was originally granted TPS because of Hurricane Mitch, but in the ensuing two decades, that country has been besieged by drug cartel violence, by gang violence. Um, it ranks as one of the most dangerous in the world. El Salvador has the highest murder rate, um, or had it at least a couple of years ago. Still incredibly difficult place. The U.S. State Department has travel warnings in place for those two countries um, because of how dangerous, because of the risk of kidnappings, of extortion, of things like that. Um, and so, yeah, now we're expected to send back tens of thousands of people to those countries at a time when things are so bad that people are fleeing those countries to try to come to the United States to, to claim asylum. So that sort of, it, it just shows just how complicated this is and how tough that decision is going to be for these folks. All right, Alan Gomez of USA Today joining us from Miami. Thanks so much. Thank you. The Department of Defense has a proposed budget of $686 billion for 2019. And as you can imagine, the lion's share of that money goes to planes, ships, weaponry, and personnel to fight a conventional war. But the U.S. and its allies are also preparing for a new kind of warfare, fought not on land and sea and air, but across computer networks. News Hour Weekend Special Correspondent Christopher Livesay has a story from Tallinn, Estonia. The clock is ticking as NATO jumps into action to protect one of their own. There are NATO nations that have deterrence force troops on the island of Borrelia, and they're trying to deter aggression from Kronzonia. Borrelia's power grid has been hacked, its water system contaminated. The drones, they need to fly their mission around. And its surveillance drones sent off course, leading Europe to the brink of war. It may be um, attacked this way. No, you haven't missed the latest news from Europe. This is not real war. It's a war game, the largest live fire cyber defense exercise in the world, involving more than 1,000 experts from 30 nations. It's called Locked Shields. The nerve center of the operation is a hotel ballroom in the picturesque Eastern European city of Tallinn, Estonia. It's the home of the event's organizers, the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. The most serious threats are coming from nations and nation states uh, affiliated groups. The center's director, Estonian Meryl Maigra, says in a world more and more dependent on the internet, these war games are more important than ever. The most dangerous targets are in critical information infrastructure, our banking systems, our traffic control systems, our ports, airports. All of this is run by systems that um, were set up in the 70s or 80s when cybersecurity measures weren't really the first priority and thereby they are vulnerable to cyber attacks as more and more systems are, are linked up with the internet. So hypothetically speaking, a, an attacker could target the air traffic control system of a country and 
cause a plane crash. Absolutely. Uh, theoretically speaking, you don't really need to start a war by targeting the military. A code can uh, render your uh, fighter pilots incapable even before they take off. The CCDCOE has been running locked shields every year since 2010 with a similar scenario. The fictional country of Crimsonia, which seeks to dominate the region, launches a massive cyber attack against the equally fictional Beryllia. Beryllia calls on its NATO allies for help. Although the scenario isn't real, the attacks are meant to mimic threats that are. Threats like those NATO faces from potentially hostile countries, including Russia. That is exactly what happened two years back in Ukraine when the attacks against the power grid happened. 22 so-called blue teams from NATO and EU nations must defend Beryllia. They'll be ranked on how well they protect its electricity grid, emergency communication system, surveillance drones, and water supply from the hackers. American commander Michael Widman is one of the coordinators. These are the actual mock-ups of the water generation plants that we're using during the exercise. You can see the uh, blue team numbers corresponding to the teams that are trying to defend them. This one here has been compromised. The water's turned green, so it's not suitable for human consumption. Blue is safe. Green means there's too little chlorine in the water supply. Red, too much. From overall, looking at the uh, models here, three teams have lost control of their water purification plants. And that's leading to bigger problems. Citizens from Aborilia have gotten sick. The deterrence force personnel that are on the island are now having to deal with sick personnel, sick Berlian citizens. They're also dealing with riots. They're also dealing with uh, a proxy group from Crimsonia that are ethnic Crimsonians within Borrelia, and they're taking the advantage of the incidents that are occurring uh, to destabilize the government, essentially. During the Locked Shields event, defenders usually compete remotely from their home countries. The Estonian team was in secure rooms at CCDCOE headquarters in Tallinn. That's where we found the American team as well. In past years, the U.S. competed on its own and didn't always fare well. In 2017, it came in 12th. This year, the U.S. teamed up with three Baltic countries, including Estonia, which came in second last year. The more we can learn from one another. U.S. Army Colonel Brian Vile says it just made sense. Really this year was a complete change in tact. We said we're not going to compete individually. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to cooperate, learn from one another. And that way, if we finish first or we're with the team that finished first, we make sure that we figure out what they're doing that's so good and we can take it back to ourselves and hopefully push that back out to all the other teams that we work with and all the other allies. The game lasts two days. In the end, each team defending Beryllia took hits. All the surveillance drones and emergency communication systems were compromised in some way, as were a little over half the electricity and water systems. There's a lot of learning, actually. Yeah, there is a lot. The U.S. Estonia team came in fourth. But Colonel Vile says winning is not the point of locked shields. Learning is. It's all about cooperation. It's all about information sharing. None of us is as smart as all of us. Something is very, very wrong. So the great thing that we're getting out of this is the ability to work with the partners. So if something ever does happen in the real world, we're that much better prepared for it. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has many jobs to fill. The State Department is still missing key officials, including ambassadors to nations like Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And there is concern that it is difficult to find candidates who are both experienced and acceptable to the White House. Political reporter Nahal Tusi has been covering the story, joins us now from Washington, D.C. Let's first talk about the number of jobs. Put this in perspective for us. How much work does Mike Pompeo have ahead of him? Well, there's more than 70 positions that don't have a nominee, and many of those are ambassadorships, uh, but they also include uh, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries of state. Uh, these are very high-level leadership positions. Uh, and there are uh, several positions that have nominees, but they haven't been confirmed yet. And what's the tension at the White House? What's the sort of acceptability bar? Well, one of the key things is that if any, if it was anyone who was on a, a, a signer of the Never Trump letters, these were many Republican national security and foreign policy experts, uh, they've basically been blacklisted by this White House. If uh, anyone has ever said anything bad or critical about the president, um, he doesn't want them. 
uh, in any of these positions at the State Department. There's a very high loyalty test. Uh, and so it's, it's meant that the bench is a lot slimmer uh, than it would have been in past administrations. So would Mike Pompeo have any better chance of getting a never-Trumper through than Rex Tillerson did? Uh, I wouldn't uh, say he has a good chance right now. Uh, but over time, he might have uh, a better chance. And the reason for that is he, ha he has a pretty good relationship with the president. And he might be able to convince the president that, look, some of these guys, they're really experts. Uh, and even though they signed those letters, say, during the campaign, they want to serve you now. So what about the career diplomats and um, where they're placed and how they're positioned compared to the appointments that uh, Pompeo could make or the ones that deserve Senate confirmation? Well, you know, every administration uh, has a certain level of political appointees and then the, the career appointees. Uh, in, in the past, um, presidents have, uh, when it comes to ambassadorships, uh, about 30 percent have gone to political appointees and the other 70 percent have been drawn from career uh, diplomatic ranks. Uh, but the Career Foreign Service really hopes that Pompeo turns to them whenever possible to fill some of these top positions, uh, especially when it comes to positions like undersecretary for political affairs or uh, the director general of the Foreign Service, which is kind of like the human resources mm -hmm. chief. So they're hoping that this is a good opportunity for Pompeo to show that he does care about the Foreign Service, which Tillerson did not seem to do. It is still very, very early in his tenure, but any indications that the culture might be different than under the Tillerson regime? Well, Pompeo uh, so far has gone out of his way to praise uh, members of the Foreign Service and the Civil Service who work for him at the State Department. He did not bring in any outside aides or advisors, uh, and that was a really good signal to a lot of people at the State Department because it meant that he was going to rely on them for what he needed, at least for now. Um, and that was quite different than uh, what Secretary Tillerson did because he came in and largely, you know, was surrounded by a handful of people he brought in from the outside, and they basically cut off his access uh, to the uh, Foreign Service and, and vice versa. What are, what's the kind of net effect of all these open positions? Is the State Department, I mean, it has thousands and thousands of employees, is it functioning less effectively than it could? When you have assistant secretaries on issues like human rights or, you know, for the Middle East, which we, we don't have one right now, uh, those are the guys who t typically are the ones who are t talking to foreign counterparts, telling them, you know, keeping them up to date on what's going on, keeping people in the loop. And, you know, now they're not there. And so there's these like empty positions and people overseas, foreign leaders, uh, foreign diplomats, they don't know who to turn to at the State Department. And they just feel like um, they feel like things are a bit lost. And so there's a bit of a vacuum on hmm. a lot of levels. All right. Nahal Tusi of Politico, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We turn now to an art exhibit here in New York City that examines the relationship between the rise of nationalism and censorship of the arts. NewsHour Weekend's Yvette Feliciano reports. Countries from Poland to Hungary to Turkey are experiencing a rise in nationalism and the effects it can have on free speech. While this turmoil goes on, a new exhibit at New York's Neue Gallery before the fall, examines art produced in Germany and Austria under the Third Reich, and what can happen to a culture when free speech is curtailed in the extreme. The idea behind the exhibition is to think about how artists reacted to political historical circumstances and how they work evolved during the 1930s. So it was really like thinking about is there a potential in art to reflect on historical circumstances? Dr. Olaf Peters is an art historian at Germany's Martin Luther University and the exhibit's curator. The show is a continuation of two previous Neue shows. Degenerate Art examined works that the Nazi party publicly denigrated, while Berlin Metropolis looked at the rich artistic culture of Germany's capital in the 1920s. Adolf Hitler's Third Reich purged the modern art world after coming to power in 1933. It raided the influential Bauhaus Art School and shut it down. It did the same to the modern art wing of the German National Gallery. Hitler banned many artists from creating art altogether. You had an extremely strong and rich art scene during the 1920s in Germany. For me, the question was always, what happened to this art scene? Peter says that many artists camouflage their beliefs using conventional art forms, 
still lifes and portraits became heavy with symbolism. Landscapes like the 1936 painting Expectation by German artist Richard Utze depicted dark and foreboding scenes. It's a little bit apocalyptic landscape on the one side and you have uh, on the other side a group of people standing there and looking maybe into a dark or unknown future. Those artists who did not conform could not find a safe venue for their work. How was their work received at the time by the public? Some are so overt when it comes to critique of the circumstances, the living conditions of the Third Reich, that it's uh, impossible to, to show them. One artist who chose self-exile was the German painter Max Beckmann, who left Germany for the Netherlands in 1937. There he painted a work called Bird's Hell, which contains political references to the Nazi party. It was painted one year after Max Beckmann has left, had left uh, Germany. And in Amsterdam he made the decision to create this allegory of his country, where you can see the birds torturing, for example, saluting. Some artists paid the ultimate price for their work. One was a Jewish-Austrian artist named Friedel Dieker Brandeis. She was highly political. She studied at the Bauhaus in Weimar in Germany, went back to Austria and developed some, let's say, political montages or collages in the early 1930s. But she was captured. She depicted some interrogations, which are really touching because you can see what torture meant and she was finally brought uh, into an extermination camp and was killed. She Dr. Peters picture. says that visitors and, to the exhibit um, may view these older have... works in a new light following a recent nationalist surge in Europe. The situations are different and um, history is not repeating itself but of course you have to learn from history. Maybe think about how to to avoid developments which are not now a little bit similar, not identical, um, and um, yeah, and being be aware of your responsibility. This is PBS NewsHour Weekend Saturday. This past week was May Day, when many countries paused to honor workers. This year, photographers from Agence France Press took a look at those around the world whose jobs have become increasingly rare, thanks to advances in technology. The series is called The Disappearing Jobs of Yesterday. The idea was to show the jobs that have been part of our lives for decades and are slowly disappearing around the world. Eric Badra is AFP's photo editor for North America. The first idea originally was to find jobs that are disappearing because of the internet revolution, because of the digital revolution. But then there were so many ideas and so many nice portraits coming that we kind of broadened a little bit the idea and, and, and made it just simple, simply as disappearing jobs. AFP's photographers captured a wide range of jobs, from one of the last gas lamp lighters in London to a bookbinder in Bulgaria, a key maker on the streets of Beijing and a sewing machine repairman in Belgrade. The project even highlighted photographers themselves. The, the, you know, the film photography, the street portrait photographers on touristic places and everything, iPhones and selfies are killing those jobs. So it was kind of a, an immediate uh, reflex for photographers to talk about photographers. And in Rio, Brazil, there's at least one video rental store remaining. It's true that the idea that DVD or video uh, rental is totally disappearing. It was the big thing in the 90s or, or, or the 80s, and it's now totally gone. So when you have one frame that is consistent everywhere in the world, you can show a moment in, the, in, in life everywhere the same way, and, and people uh, yeah, buy that a lot. They are very interested. And a reminder to join us on PBS NewsHour Weekend tomorrow. We look at a controversial work requirement for low-income residents of Maine as other states model similar programs. I'm incredibly proud that Maine is seen as a model. Maine is not a model. It's a cautionary tale. That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.